right so today we are going to discuss the current affairs for the third week august third week so specially the first important uh, the aspect is euthanasia tourism usually you might have come across the term medical tourism but currently this particular aspect is under the huge debate that is euthanasia tourism so first of all what is euthanasia euthanasia is nothing but mercy killing euthanasia is nothing but mercy killing you just understand there is a particular article in the in the constitution of india which is interpreted multiple times that is article 21 of the constitution what is article 21 right to life and liberty right to life and liberty this article was under the considerable debate and discussion in the judiciary because you might have heard bijoy emmanuel versus state of kerala what is that case about national anthem case where supreme court has uh, interpreted article 19 as right to silence article 19 as right to silence specially we have article 19 class 1 sub class a which talks about right to free speech and expression supreme court has interpreted this particular article as right to silence right to silence then what happened in a particular case called as p ratinam what is that case p ratinam in this particular case in that in this particular case supreme court has interpreted article 21 not only it covers right to life it also covers right to death are you able to understand the logic since article 19 class 1 sub class a talks about right to silence originally talks about the right to free speech and expression supreme court interpreted it as right to silence similarly article 21 talks about the right to life supreme court interpreted right to life as a right to death also a person is eligible for the dignified death so this was interpreted by the supreme court in ratinam case later and there is another case called as gyan kaur versus gyan kaur versus state of punjab state of punjab in this particular case supreme court has revised its judgment because you know article 137 of the constitution which talks about the supreme court power to revise its own judgments to revise its own judgments in this particular case supreme court has revised its judgment stating that right to life that is article 21 does not cover right to death does not cover right to death are you able to understand the consequences initially it has covered right to death as a part of article 21 later it has revised its judgment again it see it held that right to life that does not cover right to death and later another landmark case another landmark case in the year 2011 in the year 2011 what is that case you know what is that aruna shanbag what is that aruna shanbag versus union of india in this particular case supreme court for the first time legalized the euthanasia legalized the euthanasia what is the meaning of euthanasia euthanasia is nothing but mercy killing supreme court has interpreted especially if you try to see this particular case la very very you know very very sad case it is aruna shanbag was a nurse in a particular hospital she was raped by the ward boy by tying her with the you know the chain of a dog and what happened eventually she went into a comatose situation and she had been on the bed itself but without any movement any any mobility for that reason a particular ngo called as common cause had filed a petition in the supreme court and begged the supreme court requested the supreme court please grant her mercy death mercy killing because she is on the terminally ill situation what is that terminally ill terminally illness means terminal illness means there is no situation to recover back okay it is irreversible situation okay she will be undergoing the death so kindly give her mercy killing because she is suffering huge hugely she is suffering okay her suffering is immeasurable so that is the reason why they have requested to grant the you know what is that mercy killing for the first time supreme court has said okay for the mercy killing in this particular case called aruna shanbag versus union of india case now right to life also covers right to dignified death 
right to cover right to life also covers a right to dignified death and this particular verdict is applicable to all the cases where the patients are on the terminal illness because if any case if the patient is not able to revert by, back to the original situation you need to apply this particular mercy killing right so but uh, supreme court did not permit every form of mercy killing actually the mercy killing is of two types one is passive euthanasia and second one is a active euthanasia what is that passive and active passive means passive means suppose if a, if a patient is uh, surviving on the medicine but she he is suffering a lot due to the terminal illness then what you do you simply withdraw the life supporting system suppose the patient is on the ventilator you just withdraw the ventilator definitely the patient dies if the patient needs a daily dose of a medicine what you have to do you simply stop administering such medicine they will be undergoing the death so that is called as passive euthanasia and second category is called as active euthanasia what is active euthanasia you will be in administering or injecting some lethal dose of medicine or lethal injection so that will result in the death of the person so in india which euthanasia is permitted passive euthanasia is permitted so what is the requirement because a person's life, right to life also covers right to dignified death because at the time of death she mu he must not be undergoing unnecessary pain okay which is not useful to him okay that is the reason why in order to secure the dignity supreme court has selectively permitted the passive euthanasia right but one important thing you must understand it is applicable only to the terminally ill patients terminally ill patients right so one important thing let us see what are the supreme court guidelines in this particular case what kind of guidelines supreme court has given in this particular aruna shanba case because it will be helpful in understanding the current affairs right supreme court has has clearly given a clear guideline because one more important thing you must understand supreme court has a power to give you complete justice complete justice under article 142 of the constitution of india do you know this article 142 of the constitution of india empowers the supreme court to render the complete justice in any particular case wherever the law is absent wherever the rules and regulation does not explain any particular situation in that particular case supreme court can give the complete justice in the art, under article 142 of the constitution of india right so that is the reason why supreme court has given detailed guidelines in what cases the passive euthanasia is permissible what are the eligible cases under the passive euthanasia first one in the first stage the patient has to give the living will what is that what is the meaning of living will whenever he is alive whenever he is under the consciousness he will he will be giving a will to a particular doctor stating that sir in case if i reach any terminal illness please take away my life okay by withdrawing the support system so that is called as living will right so first of all the living will has to be given to the doctor who is giving the treatment okay doctor who is giving the treat what this particular doctor has to do the doctor has to convey it to the hospital management and the management of the hospital will be constituting a committee what is that a committee this committee will be consisting of three doctors three members so it will be having three members who are doctors in different wings of the medicine so like cardiologist okay and urologist like that okay different types of doctors will be the members of the committee and this committee will be looking into the situation whether this case is eligible for the euthanasia or not because whether this particular patient is on the terminal illness or not that must be properly examined and this particular committee will be giving the report and this report will be submitted to district collector it will be submitted to district collector then what does the district collector do he will again constitute constitute an, another committee second committee this committee is also a three membered committee and this committee will be observing the report will be verifying the report of the first committee will be verifying the report of the first committee then if this committee gives the report stating that yes the report that was given by the first committee is very much valid then what will happen district collector will give the information to the judicial magistrate he will give the information to the judicial magistrate then the judicial magistrate will execute this particular passive euthanasia he will be giving the permission for the administration of the passive euthanasia do you understand how elaborate mechanism has been given by the supreme court tell me is it simple procedure or complex procedure very very complex procedure 
because you need to take adequate measures so that the innocent life cannot be taken away. So stay, seeing the burden of the particular patient, the family member should not try to di disown him because right to life is his fundamental right. So it must be taken away only in a particular situation where the situation is very much uh, hostile to the person. Okay, so you need to identify the eligible person and the right situation. For that reason, this elaborate guidelines were provided. So this makes uh, the passive euthanasia is easy or simple or complex in India, very much complex. But you just understand, this is a case. What is the situation here? Euthanasia tourism. What is happening? There are certain individuals who are suffering a lot due to the rare diseases. They are finding this particular process of passive euthanasia very much harder in the country. They are going to the other country and getting administered with the euthanasia. There are certain countries which are having the simple procedure to administer the passive euthanasia and those countries are approached by the individuals who are suffering from the rare diseases. There are certain diseases which will involve huge implications, huge complications for the individual. They will be undergoing huge suffering and uh, those suffering cannot be addressed by the euthanasia process in the country because in India the process of euthanasia is very very complex. For that reason they migrate to other countries. So what is the euthanasia tourism? When a person travels to a country offering euthanasia or assisted suicide as a legal option because the act is forbidden or more restrictive in his home country. Within his home country, this process is very much complex. That is the reason why the people are migrating to the other countries for the sake of the assisted suicide or active euthanasia or passive euthanasia, whatever it is. Right. So what is the case here? So context, a petition was filed before the court and who is suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome actually the friend of this particular person has petitioned the supreme court stating that sir my friend is going some switzerland for the sake of assisted suicide or euthanasia please restrain him from not going from india to the other country reason she cited was this person is not on the terminal illness i told you what is the condition the terminal illness is the condition but he is not on the terminal illness his situation is well reversible but his pain is very much huge okay for that reason uh, the, the friend of this particular person has petitioned the court. Okay, right. So what is that particular disease? That disease is called as chronic fatigue syndrome. What is that syndrome? Chronic fatigue syndrome. So the chronic fatigue syndrome is a serious disease and it is a complex of various symptoms. So it is impacting the nervous system. It is impacting the immune system and uh, it is impacting also the production of energy in the body. So that is creating uh, huge complications for the individual. So that syndrome is called as chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay, so he will be feeling excessive tiredness despite he is not doing anything. So that situation is called as chronic fatigue syndrome. For that reason, he is migrating to the, to the Switzerland for the sake of the assisted suicide. Okay, right. so what is the treatment? There is no specific cure. There is no approved treatment. So this is what the situation which is prompting him to go to the visit the Switzerland for the sake of the passive euthanasia. So what are the causes? The causes are still unknown. It is still under the research. Okay, right. So there is no specific test even. Even you can't diagnose the disease by means of any specific test. Even there is a literal absence of the test as well as the diagnosis and also the medicine. So for that reason, he is migrating. You must understand this kind of situations will definitely prompt the government of India to bring out a law. Are you able to understand why this situation has emerged? What is the reason? Because law is not clear. Because Supreme Court has given guidelines on the basis of a specific case. So what is the duty of the legislature? The duty of the legislature is to ensure a particular law is to be enacted to cover all the situations, all the like situations under the ambit of the law. Otherwise, what will happen? There will be ambiguity. Every time any new situation arises, what you have to do? You simply approach the judiciary. Is that right mechanism? No. This kind of things definitely prompt the government to bring out a specific legislation covering what are the cases eligible under the passive euthanasia, what are the cases not eligible under the passive euthanasia. Are you able to understand? Right. So, as I already discussed, the Aruna Shanba case is a very, very landmark judgment which has given the term passive euthanasia. Okay. So, it is nothing but right to dignified death. So, why? the right to die is, uh, rem remains as a debate across the world. So these are all the countries, okay? So the red color countries, okay? These are all the countries where euthanasia is illegal. 
and active euthanasia is legal so in the case in the case of canada and other countries even in the australia also passive euthanasia is legal most of the global countries are following the passive euthanasia including india including india okay so that's why simply in order to get administered with a lethal injection simply people are migrating to those countries where active euthanasia is permissible legally okay so that is the reason why it also exposes the lack of global agreement on this particular important issue are you able to understand suppose if there is a global agreement on this in, on this particular issue tell me whether this kind of tourism is possible no so this is also another important concern so in switzerland the assisted suicide is illegal around 1.5 percentage of swiss deaths are results of this particular practice so where assisted suicide assisted suicide means if a person requires to die the doctor will be assisting so tell me is it ethical not at all ethical actually the medical ethics talk about the nursing or you know nurturing the patient or helping the patient to get out of the disease situation but unfortunately the medical ethics are under the serious violation okay and people also traveled to switzerland for the assisted suicide with the statistics from 2018 indicating that around 211 people visited the country for it you understand so more people are migrating or visiting such countries where the assisted suicide is uh, legal and there is no requirement to be terminally ill this is what the important lacune or lapse on part of the laws of laws of the countries which are promoting the active euthanasia so you need not to be terminally ill just illness is enough so such thing is very very bad for the ethics so coming to the issues there is a lapse there is a violation of the medical ethics because doctors and uh, the medical agencies are just ignoring their ethical responsibility it is their responsibility to safeguard the lives of the patients the actually medicine talks about the saving the lives of the people but not taking away the lives of the people so this is about the medical ethics and morally wrong because you are killing the person instead of saving the person so anyway you are killing the person definitely it is morally wrong and vulnerable become more prone to it you just understand you just understand the situation of country like india there are many vulnerable people even elderly people are also called as vulnerable people because at the elderly age the possibility of caring from their children may be decreasing so at that point of time they may be giving the living will for the sake of their euthanasia so that's the reason why vulnerable people will become more prone to it and one more important thing in the countries like india the hospital care is medical care is very very worst because government is not spending enough on the health sector okay the per capita expenditure is very very meager and very very little so approximately 1.5 to 1.7 percentage of gdp is just spent on the health sector it requires at least 4 to 5 uh, percentage of the gdp to be spent on the health infrastructure so because of that reason the possibility of the vulnerable sections to become more and more vulnerable is very very high suicide versus euthanasia actually euthanasia is another form of suicide so definitely you are promoting this particular euthanasia and you are indirectly promoting the suicide and x factor what is x factor in the medicine there are many miracles any miracle can happen in the lives of the people you are not letting the person to experience such miracle by taking the life in a premature fashion okay so these are the specific uh, important uh, dimensions of the lapses on, uh, with respect to the euthanasia okay right did you understand what is euthanasia mercy killing okay supreme court has given its judgment in which case aruna shanbag versus un of india case 2011 okay where it has selectively permitted the passive euthanasia and it also has given detailed guidelines what is the concern here because in the absence of a specific law defining what all the like cases falling under the passive euthanasia in the absence of such law so the administration of passive euthanasia became very much difficult that is giving very very complex situation and prompting the people to visit the other countries where euthanasia is legal okay but there is a importance for the euthanasia as well because in the answer when you are writing you must give a balanced picture okay you should not be one sided okay you must not be prejudiced okay for that reason you must also portray the positive side of the euthanasia okay it ends the pain it also respects the person's choice because he is choosing the death is better than the what is that painful life okay right 
and th third one is treatment for others definitely in hospital in india the hospital sector the health sector is very very problematically positioned so that's why the end of the life of a particular person may give the bed for the other people treatment for the other people and the dignified death okay he will be dying with dignity and lastly addressing the mental agony this is what very very important when the person is uh, under the mental agony when the person is under the mental distress there is no meaning of the keeping the person alive okay that's the reason why these are the significant points why we can support the passive euthanasia in the country okay so did you get the balanced picture yes sir no because when the person is undergoing a serious trauma both mental and phys physical during the situation if you observe the person he will be completely bereft of the dignity because if a person is usually suffering you can't consider the person is enjoying the dignity are you able to understand you just visit the cancer hospitals you can see the agony of the patients they will just stay, tell the doctors please take away my life rather than persisting me on the death bed okay right supreme court upholds delhi assembly summons to facebook this is also very very significant issue okay supreme court upholds delhi assembly summons to facebook okay right very very important case it is what happened recently 2018-19 what happened there was a delhi riots there were rioting situation in delhi what was what kind of riots those were communal riots okay communal riots so during the communal riots what happened the position of social media was under the huge discussion because social media actually added the fuel to the fire by spreading the fake news on the social media so one of the important platform that was under the investigation is facebook the facebook role was under the serious and critical questioning what happened if you try to see the background what is social media social media means it is a internet based form of communication okay and social media platforms allow the users to have the conservations okay and share the information and create the web content this is what called social media so primarily it is internet based organization right internet based platform what happened in february 2020 delhi witnessed widespread communal riots okay then what happened in response to that so actually there were two committees two committees one is the committee which was appointed by the parliament parliamentary committee do you know what are the standing committees standing committees actually what is the committee system of the parliament committee system means actually you take parliament or state legislature they will not be on the continuous sessions okay actually constitution says that at least there must be two sessions not exceeding 6 months duration in between two sessions that is what the constitutional requirements this will uphold the executive responsibility to the legislature are you able to understand yes and the maximum number of sessions is not specified in the constitution because if you specify the maximum number definitely the administration can be impacted negatively because the executive cannot stay answering the queries of the legislature continuously ignoring the requirements of the administration actually that's the reason why the parliament and the state legislature had evolved two import the important in, uh, instruments in their hands uh, called as committee system actually in parliament or state legislature there will be two types of committees two types of committees one type first type is called as permanent committees second type is called as ad hoc committees okay so simply speaking there are two types of committees one is standing committees those are also known as permanent committees second types of committees are called as ad hoc committees what is the role of these committees these committees will be acting as a mini parliament these committees will be acting as mini parliament what is the responsibility of the legislature responsibility has to ensure the continuous watch on the executive act activities since the legislative sessions are restricted only to a particular point of time it is practically not possible for the legislature to to take account of the executive activities for that reason these committees will be ensuring a continuous surveillance on the administration for example in the parliament we have 24 standing committees how many 24 standing committees 24 standing committees are actually appointed on different ministries 
different uh, ministries. Every standing committee will be taking care of certain administrative ministry. Okay. If you try to see the legislative sessions, the members of the parliament will be questioning the ministers. Questioning the ministers. It means at the platform of legislature, there is an interface between the ministers and the legislators. Okay. But on the other hand, the committee system will enable the members of parliament to directly take the accountability from the bureaucrats. They will be able to take the direct accountability from the bureaucrats. Are you able to understand? On the floor of the house, you can take the political accountability. But because of these standing committees, what, you, what can you do? You can definitely seek the administrative accountability. So that will uh, make the surveillance on the executive a complete process. Are you able to understand? Yes. Just consider this case. During the daily, uh, daily riots, what happened? The Facebook as a platform which was widely misused by some miscreants. Okay, so it was widely misused. People have uh, spread very, very wrong propaganda on the Facebook. And the Facebook specifically has failed to contain such a malicious propaganda. For that reason, what happened? The legislature, especially the parliament, uh, actually constituted a committee, the committee, the standing committee on information technology or IT ministry that has summoned the Facebook uh, president of India. There is a president for the Facebook at the India. So at the all India level, he was summoned by the parliament. Then what happened? He has attended the parliamentary committee. Similar thing was also done by the Delhi assembly. Similar thing was also done by the Delhi assembly because Delhi assembly also summoned the Facebook president. Okay. To come and attend the, what is that? Interrogation or questioning. Then what happened? He declined. He simply stated, since the matter has, uh, matter falls under the parliament, I don't have the requirement to attend the committee okay, that was uh, constituted by the Delhi Assembly. This was a reasoning. Then what happened? The Delhi uh, you know, committee, the Delhi State Legislative Assembly committee has frequently summoned the same person multiple times. Then what happened? He has challenged the particular thing in the Supreme Court stating that the Delhi Assembly has no jurisdiction to prompt my presence in front of it because the matter does not fall under the Delhi Assembly. Okay, rather it falls under the union parliament. Are you able to understand? Because information definitely falls under the union list. So simply I don't want to attend, please give me some immunity. Then what happened? What's the Supreme Court held, you know? Okay. It has elucidated that uh, even the matter does not fall under the jurisdiction of the Delhi Assembly. Definitely the Facebook uh, president has to attend the committee of the Delhi Assembly because legislature has very very important functions legislature has very very important functions what are the important functions it is having the elective principle it is having the expressive functions teaching functions information functions and finally legislative functions even the matter does not fall under the jurisdiction of certain legislature even then also you require to attend the committee because every legislature will enjoy the what is that parliamentary parliamentary privileges so that's the reason why court held that the function of the Delhi Assembly, the, uh, the committee is wider than the enacting laws. Hence, they could conduct any inquisition into the events leading to the Delhi rights. So they can conduct any inquiry. And during their inquiry, they found the fault with the Facebook. That is the reason why they have summoned the Facebook president. And that's the reason why Supreme Court has given very much a emphatical importance to the parliamentary privileges. So what are the parliamentary privileges? Parliamentary privileges are nothing but what is the meaning of privilege? Privilege means these are nothing but special rights. When your rights are different from that of others, that is nothing but privilege. When you have been provided with any additional rights, that is nothing but privilege. So under the constitution of India, under article 105 and, and article 194, 105 relating to the union parliament and 194 relates to the state legislative assembly. So these cover the parliamentary privileges. So parliamentary privileges will ensure because the legislature must be having a superior position. Okay. So that is the reason why within its own matters, that is the reason why the privileges will ensure the authority, dignity and supremacy. These privileges ensure authority, dignity and supremacy for the legislature. So it means the parliaments and legislatures can formulate formulate their procedure without the influence of the other agencies. 
without the influence of legislature and executive they can conduct they can formulate their own conduct and their own procedures and secondly the legislature also has the power to initiate the contempt proceedings what is that contempt proceedings contempt proceedings means if any person declines the authority of the legislature or makes any derogatory comment on the legislature the legislature has the power to initiate the contempt proceedings to punish the wrong doer so this will enable the legislature to function as an independent agency because in the constitution of india we talk about the separation of powers between the legislature executive and judiciary and these agencies must be given with the specified powers and also they must be given some autonomy otherwise they cannot perform their functions in order to enable the smooth functioning of these agencies especially with respect to the legislature we have been given what we have given the parliamentary privileges under article 105 and 194 if any legislator is denied with the information if any legislator is is denied with the basic respect definitely that legislature the legislator can take the recourse under the parliamentary privileges so in this particular case also the legislature can seek the information from the facebook president despite the matter does not fall under the legislature so this is what the important thing okay as you know who uh, the parliamentary privileges are very very important things for the independence and autonomy of the legislature and the speaker has been given a specific responsibility to uphold the dignity of the house to uphold the dignity respect and authority of the house okay right what is the mechanism to enforce the parliamentary privileges so initially the mp will be giving the request or petition to the i mean speaker of the uh, lok sabha the speaker of the lok sabha will be referring the matter to the privileges committee this privileges committee will be inquiring into that matter so it will also be summoning the concerned official who has violated the rights of the legislator and then it will be preparing the report so the report will be submitted to the speaker the speaker will lay down the report on the floor of the house okay and in front of the house and the house will be taking the decision on the speak on the report whether to give the any penalty or imprisonment that will be taken and one more important thing the legislators have the ultimate and absolute right to free speech and expression what is that absolute right to free speech and expression actually if you try to see article 19 class 1 sub class a what does it talk about right to free speech and expression whether the restrictions are available against this particular right yes under article 19 class 2 what does it mean in the constitution of india the fundamental rights are not absolute in nature they are qualified in nature what is the meaning of qualified because for any fundamental right there will be availability of reasonable restrictions what is it reasonable restrictions especially you just understand indian society is very very complex and diverse society so definitely it is a important uh, function on part of the government to ensure the rights uh, of the person and the rights of the community must be balanced because you have the right to enjoy your own fundamental right but you don't have the right to violate the rights of the others that is the reason why the restrictions are mentioned okay but you just understand article 105 gives the absolute right to free speech and expression to the members of the parliament and mlas according to article 194 on the floor of the house he can speak anything that can that it comes to his mind okay why because public representatives must be given the freedom to express their opinions freely fearlessly so that is what the essence of the parliamentary privileges okay so simply in this particular case also actually if you try to see another important point the parliamentary privileges can be expressed in two ways individually and collectively individually means as a member of parliament i can exercise such privileges and collectively also as a house as a whole so it can also enjoy the collective privileges okay right and one more important thing so there is a another intense debate that is being uh, debated in the indian polity is the social media how the social media is misusing its position how the social media is misusing its position even in this particular case also supreme court also lauded the role of the facebook because social media has many advantages so what are the advantages of this facebook social media offers variety of the entertainment it will also offer people to people interaction basically in the traditional media not all the grievances and concerns of the people will be represented because of the uh, constraints of the space or time or anything like that 
but the social media media will give the individual as a platform to express his own grievances it means every individual can become a journalist are you able to understand he does not require any representation so that's the reason why social media has revolutionized the way you are communicating with the society hence uh, it is very much important it will provide you entertainment it will provide you people to people interaction and it is instrumental in pro democracy fights in many oppressive regimes especially in countries where the dictators are ruling in those countries the social media became a very very game changer social media also played an important role in bringing out uh, the stories of me too victims do you know me too victims it exposes the very very um, what is that uh, experiences of sexual harassment by the women especially the celebrities social media also playing crucial role in the disaster relief blood donation drives etc okay these are the positive sides of the social media but on the other hand the social media is also having so very very problematic things okay what are the problems due to the social media you understand social media will give rise to anonymous trolls without having you know the credibility or credentials you can just register on the social media and you can spread the venomous statements in the social media and moreover women face cyber rape and threats that affect the dignity of the women very very severely and fake news and communal venom in the case of delhi rights this is what the situation that has happened and fake news about the child abduction abduction gang was spread by the teenagers as a prank you just understand recently the pranking things are becoming quite common and become becoming so much vulgar they are also getting the shape of the vulgarity okay and this is the reason why we have to regulate the social media so to what extent we can regulate the social media because supreme court has prompted the debate we have to regulate the social media so why should we regulate the social media reason is actually in the constitution of india media does not have any specific fundamental right do you know this media does not have any specific fundamental right media also gets its uh, freedom of speech and expression from the very article that guarantees the freedom of speech and expression to the citizens okay so but uh, you have to exercise your freedom of expression under the domain of article 19 class 2 article 19 class 2 talks about two important grounds when and where your freedom of free speech and expression can be curtailed what are the two grounds tell me one is on the grounds of the national interest so national interest means sovereignty integrity of india security of the state friendly relations with the foreign states and public order these are the ground of the national interest secondly in the interest of the society in the interest of the society for example public order decency or morality decency or morality and contempt of the court what is the contempt of the court if any person declines the image of the judiciary in the eyes of the people or if any person willfully disobey the orders of the judiciary that is also contempt of the court okay it is granted under article 129 of the constitution which talks about the supreme court powers court of record okay right and separate act is also there contempt of the courts act of 1971 okay right defamation it is banned under it is penalized under ipc indian penal code especially section 499 500 talk about the defamation okay and the incitement to an offense so these are the grounds how your freedom of free speech and expression can be curtailed for example hate speech you are you are hearing this particular word very much routinely in the media okay these are the grounds how your rights can be regulated okay so coming to what are the regulations hence we have brought many regulations on the social media okay but many regulations are yet to be notified because the problem the intensity of the problem is rising on day to day basis for that reason more and more stringent norms must be formulated so what are the existing rules actually information technology act of 2010 was already enacted which is in the enforcement under that under that particular act what happened we have drafted we have enforced new rules in the year 2021 in the year 2021 we have uh, enforced new it rules new information technology rules tell me what is the difference between act and rules what is act what is rule act means any law which is enacted by the legislature okay any law which is enacted by the legislature both by the parliament that is lok sabha rajya sabha and has taken the consent of the president of india such thing is called as act then what is rule what is actually exact what is the exact meaning of rule actually actually the act which is enacted by the parliament which only prescribed the general guidelines 
it lacks a specific enforceability simply speaking the act enacted by the parliament is like a skeleton act enacted by the parliament is like a skeleton which does not have the self enforceability because it only gives certain general principles and guidelines okay so that is the reason why you need to provide the detailed guidelines how this particular act is to be enacted but tell me whether the parliamentarians are having that much knowledge and expertise to ensure the enforceability no they don't have the time also and the rules are quite technical in nature for that reason there is a concept called as delegated legislation what is that delegated legislation what is the meaning of delegated legislation once the act is enacted the legislature will delegate the power to the executive to make the rules and regulations why you are giving such power to the executive because executive contains many officials many bureaucrats who are having the sufficient experience in the particular field of interest and uh, they can frame the rules which can match the practical situations for that reason the rules are framed the rules and regulations are framed okay rules and regulations are nothing but operational guidelines what is that what is it called operational guidelines so how that particular it act is to be operated these are provided in the it rules of 2021 and of course whenever the executive makes the rules again these must be sending for the legislative approval okay so that is a requirement and union government has notified the information technology guidelines for the intermediaries and digital media ethics code of 2021 and supreme court also has given i mean government also has given the 3 months window period so during which every social media platform has to comply what is the aim the rules are aimed at substantially empowering the ordinary users because if any person's right is violated by the social media platform such social media platform must be giving the opportunity for the grievance redressal okay such thing is actually provided right so that there can be social media can become a source of healthy information it must not be having any scope for the malicious propaganda or fake news because fake news is not at all good for the democracy because information is the most important driver in the democracy right on basis of what you are speaking sometimes you may take the social media as an example as a source of information you may be passing the remarks so that will be giving the wrong you know base for the people so hence uh, the healthy information must be there so what do these uh, guidelines talk about these guidelines talk about certain things first one is these guidelines call upon the categories of social media intermediaries actually this uh, guidelines categorize the social media intermediaries into two types one is regular social media intermediaries and significant social media intermediaries social media intermediaries are of two types whatever the social media that we are using it is of two types according to the it rules one is regular social media intermediary and second one is a significant social media intermediary first actually what is the difference you know the significant social media intermediaries having more than 5 million users based on the users access based on the subscription basis okay the social media is categorized so the significant social media is having the users more than 5 million right and it also has given certain important things every social media must be appointing certain officers what are the officers a chief complaints officer a nodal officer to or a nodal officer to be contact is also called as nodal contact officer who should be available 24 into 7 and second third one is resident grievance officer what is that resident grievance officer why this type of officers are provided because citizen whenever his rights are infringed whenever his information is wrongly portrayed he must be given an access to these officers so that they can serve the grievance redressal so grievance redressal mechanism it also gives you a timeline during which the complaint needs to be acknowledged and the complaint needs to be solved the problem needs to be solved so what is that you know the officer will be required to acknowledge the complaint within 24 hours and also he must be able to resolve the problem within 15 days not only that in the cases specifically related to crime against women the obligation is to resolve the complaint within 24 hours so this kind of time bound response is needed to be provided by the social media otherwise the government will be taking the actions are you able to understand tell me to some extent uh, these kind of guidelines are providing the protection for the individual rights or not yes or no yes some framework is been provided but still lot of work need to be done 
because social media is completely unregulated okay right so verification is done identify identifying the originators of the messages this is also important suppose any fake media or fake news uh, is coming from a particular source the social media operator has to identify such originators and you have to spe clearly specify the burden lies on the shoulder of that particular originator and not not only that non complaints suppose if any social media is not complying these kind of norms so that will lead to loss of the protection under section 90 uh, uh, 79 of the it act what does 79 talk about it talks about the immunity immunity from the civil and criminal liability suppose on social media you have uh, alleged somebody with any bad remarks and uh, that particular person is able to file the defamation case only on the person who has posted the information not on the social media platform so how how come this particular uh, social media platform is protected because section 79 says that it is only the person who has alleged the offense he must be facing the consequences not the social media this is called as immunity so suppose if any social media platform does not follow these guidelines that social media platform will not be eligible for the immunity provided under section 79 of the it act so these are the frameworks try to be provided by the uh, government of india by means of the it rules okay tell me to some extent whether the social media's uh, uh, irregulation or irregularity is contained or not to some extent it can be contained facial recognition technology this is the third important aspect facial recognition technology do you know the aadhar judgment and right to privacy judgment do you know this actually in the case called as what is that puttaswami versus union of india case of 2017 in this particular case supreme court has historically declared right to privacy as a fundamental right right to privacy as a fundamental right and one more important thing what is a privacy what is a privacy what is right to privacy it means you have the right to make certain things uh, invisible to the others your private matters whenever whatever the matter you feel it is a private you need not disclose that matter to the others okay even others cannot have the right to get to know that particular information which you are safeguarding that is nothing but right to privacy actually supreme court earlier in various cases in kadak singh case and mp sharma case supreme court has categorically declared there is no such concept of right to privacy in the constitution of india okay but later in this particular landmark case supreme court has revised its earlier judgments and held that right to privacy is a part of the fundamental rights right to privacy is a part of the fundamental rights okay so why such shift was observed in the supreme court judgment what is what is the required what is the reason because after the revolution of the information technology the possibility of encroaching into somebody's personal space has been increased okay because technology is encroaching or is a, is able to percolate every particular place for example if police want to arrest you in a particular case in a very very simple case we can say it is a non what is that cognizable offense non cognizable offense what is that non cognizable offense non cognizable offense means which is not a grave crime which is not a serious crime in that situation what you require what the police requires he, he required to get the warrant from the court what is the meaning of warrant warrant is nothing but the permission from the court okay suppose if the police authority want to conduct the search and seizure operation at your home what is required again warrant is required but tell me after the it after the it revolution in the society whether is it necessary for the police officer to visit your home actually no he can track your movements easily because there are all cctvs okay he can track your assets sale and purchase of the assets he can track your bank balance he can track your expenditure details without giving you information such kind of silent surveillance is quite possible in the technology enabled society innocently we generally post certain pictures in the facebook and we will give the information also stating that i like biryani i love this place i like this i am single like that that kind of information is given this information is very very precious information for the social media platform because they can so they can sell this particular data to some matrimonial site are you able to understand he is making money out of your information 
and your privacy is violated on one hand. On the other hand, your data is being capitalized by some other person without your knowledge. So that's why the breach of the privacy became a common affair in the society. That is the reason why Supreme Court in this particular case has declared right to privacy as a fundamental right. Actually, in this case, Aadhaar was challenged. Why Aadhaar was challenged? Because government is taking the biometric data. And this biometric data, if it is not properly safeguarded, definitely that will violate the fundamental rights of the people. Using the biometric data, you can commit the crime on behalf of the other person. Even that person is not involved, you can implicate that particular person in the crime. So such situation may emerge. And one of the another important aspect that is under the debate is facial recognition technology. Facial recognition technology. Actually, this, this FRT has been under the serious criticism with respect to Hyderabad. There are 6 lakh cameras in Hyderabad city. And the police able, are able to track your every movement that you make in the city. Suddenly, a police officer may stop your vehicle and may actually check your details and documents. Even without having any, you know, what is that misbehavior on your part. You will be surprised to see him. He will be waiting for you. He will be just frisking you. Frisking you means he will be checking everything. Are you able to understand? This kind of obstructive role on part of the police can be seen in the city. So such kind of uh, violations and uh, encroachments are becoming common and common. Reason is the facial recognition technology. What is that facial recognition technology? It identifies the distinct features of person's face to create a biometric map, which is an alg algorithm. Then it matches to the possible individuals. Okay. It means an individual movement can be easily tracked because of the facial recognition technology. This system searches across all the da database of millions of images scrapped without knowledge or, or consent and often fails. So it means this FRT has the possibility to violate the rights of the people. See here how the facial recognition technology is working. It is capturing and scanning the faces and it is extracting the facial data. It is comparing the database and matching and identifying. In this way, the FRT is functional. It means without your knowledge, you are under the surveillance. Tell me whether the surveillance is possible under the constitution? Actually, no, because according to the Puttaswamy case, no person's privacy can be violated without his knowledge. And secondly, without the due process of law and without the procedure established by law. Because what is the demand of Article 21? What does it talk about? Right to life and liberty of any person cannot be taken away except with the procedure established by law. So whenever there is no procedure established by law, you don't have the power to violate the right of the people. So hence the FRT is giving many possibilities, individual can be tracked. But of course, FRT is having certain beneficial aspects. What are the beneficial aspects? Because you can boost the performance of the police systems functioning. Because the police system is understaffed. Because how many police constables are there? Just about 144 police constables across 1 lakh population. So it is not a good number. So the arms of the police can be strengthened by this particular technology. It can help in the prevention of the crime. And massively boost the police department's crime investigation capabilities. So they can easily you know, get the offenders to be booked under the law. And one more important thing, this will also help the international coordination with respect to the criminal investigation. So that is assisting National Crime Records Bureau's Crime and Criminal Tracking Network and Systems. What is that? CCTNS. The CCTNS is nothing but it is a networking of all the police stations in the country. It is networking about 15,000 police stations. And the criminal data is shared among the police stations okay, using this particular CCTNS. So it is also making use of the face recognition system, okay, face recognition technology. And it is increasingly being used for everything from unblocking of the mobile phones to validating the identity. Suppose if any particular person is having uh, any suspicious uh, movement, if you are suspecting him as a terrorist, what is the option in front of police? Usually the, the mobiles are having the facial recognition software. Simply you can scan the face and simply you can open the mobile. So that kind of possibility is also there. So using this, the crime prevention is very, very good. But of course, there are certain downsides. One is the absence of the framework to govern the data protection. Actually, Supreme Court has given that direction to the government. 
if the right to privacy is to be enforced in the country what is to be done you must bring the law to enforce this right to privacy but unfortunately the data protection bill which is still at the bill stage only okay it is yet to be enacted okay and no and one more important thing in the name of protecting the rights of the women and children they are misusing the face recognition technology actually if you try to see there is no evidence of the effectiveness and further squandering the precious public funds the frt has no proven benefits if you compare the rights and the benefits of the frt which must be prevailing over what rights must be prevailing over over face recognition technology okay so in this way the face recognition technology actually making it is blindly turning our public spaces into the sites of the technological experimentation without understanding the consequences of the use of such technology okay right what are the solution what is the solution we have you have to bring the data protection bill so which will be defining what is the right usage of the rule and what is the wrong usage of the technology okay right so actually i wanted to discuss this also but due to the time paucity i could not cover this so did you understand our topics today yes these are very very important for your governance thank you so much